Great. Well, uh, thank you, everybody, and I hope to live up to the hype. I also want to give a thank you to the people who provided all the food, and I've asked for caffeine IVs to be available to anybody who needs, because we are not just going to sit and listen. We are going to work. Is everybody ready? Okay. And the title is long, partly because Brian is a demanding requester. He said, I'd like you to make something interactive and yet inspirational, and if you could cover it, universal design for learning, equity, and assessment in 45 minutes. <laughs> Go. <laughs> so first, let's find out who's here. A nod to the fact that I do teach at San Francisco State just three hours that way, I think it's west. Um, so let's find out who's in the room. Who's a student? Who's a faculty member? Who is a faculty developer? or an academic technology or information technology staff member. Um, I'm going to have to put this where I can see it better so I don't turn around. How about academic affairs or student services or uh, campus leadership? Other and just shout out what other is. I don't like raising my hands when people do this. <laughs> there we go. I gotcha. All right, so we have quite a few faculty in the room and then a smattering of other people. Again, because we're going to try to cover a lot in a very little time, this is a metaphor for we're just going to hold out a paper cup from back there or maybe a wine bottle because you make wine here at Fresno State um, to catch as much as we can. And we are going to narrow the focus because assessment so big, universal design for learning is so big, equity is so big. I, I liken it to... Um, going to the eye doctor and, hey, is it clearer now? When we start putting those different lenses down, we're hoping we're going to crystallize a picture for ourselves. And what I hope we can cover today is assessment in those two contexts of universal design and equity. And we'll look at some of the principles, not all of them, because there are quite a few. And I want to give you something to do after this presentation. But also, I want to look at, again, how we apply it to uh, assessment give you some tools you can use when you go back home. And last but not least, because we have not just faculty in the room, but people in other roles, I want to make sure we start challenging ourselves to think beyond universal design for learning and equity for learning to equity and universal design in other contexts where we might be um, not assessing, but looking at achievement and, and progress and things like that. So if we start with universal design for learning, we're going to get you to raise your hands again. On a scale of 100 to a billion, you can hold up that many fingers. <clears throat> How many, it's the first time you've, you're meeting UDL for the first time. It's the first time you've heard of it. Oh, good. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, but I think everybody is, I'll be using UDL and Universal Design for Learning interchangeably. How about you've heard about UDL, but you don't know much about it? How about you've reviewed the UDL principles, but you haven't really applied it yet? How about you've started applying it to your course, and last but not least, you use it extensively? OK, so then I'm pretty much done, Brian. Uh, it seems like everybody already knows. All right, well, for just to reboot and kind of make sure we operationally define things, my favorite aspect, and they no longer have it on their site for whatever reason, but the mantra behind UDL used to be teach every student. And then there's a book that just came out by a colleague of mine, uh, Thomas Tobin, and he, it's uh, teach everyone, reach everyone. So the concept being that we, many people think of universal design for learning in the, in the framework of how do we support students with disabilities, how do we support students with specific needs, but if you look at it, it really actually also means how do we support students who have different access to technology? Uh, how do we support students who have crazy lives and different schedules than allow for what used to be a very traditional learning path? And so on. So we're going to look at how we individualize the process without making it so that we're customizing learning for every single person. We're going to start this. If you're familiar with big words, it's a good Scrabble word, equifinality, multiple pathways all to the same goal, right? And there's been a huge uptick in research and literature on brain and how it affects, uh, how our learning is um, tied to neuroscience and all that. Well, 
cast, the group that came up with universal design for learning was first or very early in the game. And so they have a model, these three, the, the principles that they have related to multiple means of representation, multiple means of action and expression, multiple means of engagement. Um, those are the what, why, and how of learning, which is a great way to look at it. If you haven't seen, they have a one page graphic organizer that uh, looks at those different principles and gives some different checkpoints related to universal design that you can look at. And you click on each one and they pop open great descriptions. But I wanted to tell a story about how I got from when we did raising our hands from I've read a lot about UDL to starting to use it. I teach, as uh, was mentioned in my bio, a class called how to learn with your mobile device. And so I teach a fully online class, sometimes 100 to 300 students in a fully online class. It's like being the mayor of a small village. There are all kinds of problems that students pose. They tell you all the things that they need and can't or cannot, uh, can or cannot do. And so universal design for learning for me was a way to make it so that I could start meeting the needs of more students in this online class. And so I st started in a simple way. And I, I started on the, the, I just keyed in on the word multiple. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, if I have my slides up, then I can record an online presentation and I can, uh, I can share the slide with the notes in it so it can act as a script. If you've seen the research by Michelle Pekansky Brock, she actually asked her students in a hybrid class which they preferred at the end of the semester and looked at the data. And it looked about 40% were downloading the slides and just reading them. 30% were um, just listening to the podcast version of it, and then the 30% were doing both, and sometimes at the same time. So our students, even if they don't have spe special needs, may have preferences, and it may be based on what they can do at the moment. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, so I've got students who are just trying to catch up while they're on BART. It's a Bay Area rapid transit. It's the, the thing that shuttles people around the Bay. And so I know that students are not going to be on a laptop. They're going to be on a mobile device. And I have to make things that they can consume and get the same information that someone who's going to sit and listen uh, for longer periods of time and so on. And then it extends to also how do we give them multiple ways to engage and be motivated. And we'll hear more about that from Marjorie later. And also uh, what, why we're here this morning, how do we give them multiple ways to show what they know? And for some people, the the what, the why, and the how of learning with respect to UDL can be, if you look at it just the right way, um, organized as how do we um, support acquisition of knowledge, how do we support uh, students interacting with one another, and how do we support students assessing themselves or being assessed. And so you can see, if we start looking at multiplying the ways that students can do these things, um, we have some options. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to give them all those options at the same time. It could be spread out over the course of a semester, right? And so as I got more sophisticated with respect to my using multiple ways for students to show what they know, I was learning from my colleagues at San Francisco State. So there's a professor in the College of Business. And when he does essay tests, he's at the center of the circle there. He provides three questions per topic that he wants to assess students on. He uses the same rubric to evaluate whether or not they've shown that they understand a specific concept from the course, but the students pick one of three questions and then they answer basically on three different pages in the little blue book that they write in. Um, they get to pick which question they're going to answer. So he's giving them a choice. It's a, it's a small choice, but it's a choice. Then how do we let students submit work in different formats? Not every student may be a strong writer, so can we let them record themselves or create multimedia or do something that might be creative and allow them to demonstrate that they understand the concepts in a way other than the traditional ways? I'll tell you from experience that when I started that second option with my students, 
I ended up with some 30 minute films <laughs> that could have been five. <laughs> so uh, you ha I've since made it that they have to write the essay first and that acts as a script for a video or acts as an outline for an infographic and so I'm encouraging them to, to move into this media literacy that's required for 21st century workers and learners but it also makes it so that there's a framework and people uh, who may or may not be used to um, writing or, or creating media are not creating versions that are gonna take a long time to review. And then you can see that there's also a way to provide different assignments. So as I uh, started learning, some of you may have heard of Elizabeth Barkley. She does a lot of work in the assessment realm. And she has this concept about uh, point accrual system. So I gamified my class so that every student starts with zero points and they earn how many points they want in order to earn the grade they want. I have 3,000 points in my class, they need 1,200 to get an A plus. And so that, and about, uh, roughly about 1,000 to get an A. Uh, and so that means that they have the ability to start choosing activities that are all analogous. They're all at the same time and it's the same as uh, the professor who has multiple questions on a page for demonstrating a specific concept. I have just three different takes on a specific activity and then, and I'll go into that in a little bit, but it uh, allows students, again, choice to show what they know in the way that's most comforting for them. Then I started thinking about, well, so I was reading an essay from one of my students and I realized that it was something that had been dictated. It was very clearly something that had been done from text uh, from speech to text, oops, sorry. And so I st started thinking, how do I encourage other students who might be having a hard time with the essay writing process, especially with so many English language learners, so many students who may not find writing to be one of their core strengths. How, because my class is not an English class. I want them to show that they understand the concepts that they have tried a learning technique, something uh, metacognition, it's called learning how to learn. And how do I get them to express that um, but not worry about whether or not they've got all the infinitives and all that stuff. And so I, I broke down the process of writing essays to, hey, there's a planning stage. And we know that especially UDL promotes using concept maps and other tools like that to help students plan out. There's also the uh, concept of outlining. And so there are different apps. One's called bubble.us for concept mapping. And one's called outlinely for outlining, and so I tell students, hey, to plan the process, don't even worry about writing it on a piece of paper or, what, or typing it up. Think of alternate ways that you can use to plan your essay. Then when it's time to draft it, pretend that you're like, like you're talking about the topic to your, your friend, and use this tool, Dragon, to record basically what you're saying and turn it into text. And then for students who, the, the hard, hardest part for them might be editing an essay. There are tools like Edit Minion, which is a robotic copy editor online, and Grammarly, which is an editing app. And the reason why I like those, they not only help students with spelling and grammar and things like that, but they also look at, hey, you're using this word a lot, especially some young students still say, like, like, and it weaves into their essay. So I just read one last night at 11.45, um, it had like in about every other sentence. And, and so that student would have benefited from Grammarly saying you're using this word a lot, maybe you want to use a different word or not use it at all. And so it's not that they have to use all three of these sets of tools, but now the part that's giving them the hardest trouble, um, they can pick a different pathway to get to what I want, which is them showing what they know related to the topics in my class. So another thing that I've done is I've created quests. Again, I gamified my class and so my modules, I just changed the name to quests, but now it's exciting. So students have pathways to look at different levels of challenge and different uh, uh, ways to express what they know. Again, over time, not all at the same time. So the first week of each quest, they watch some mini lectures that have been recorded and then they take some quizzes. Right there, they're showing they understand things at a basic level. Then they engage in discussions with their fellow students and that's a kind of a mid-range, higher level of points than the quizzes. And the week three, they're writing a reflection about something that they planned to do at the beginning. They say, hey, uh, 
let's say we're looking at how the body affects learning. I was talking to someone earlier. The eggs were a better choice than the pastries because you have longer energy throughout the day if you're eating protein in the morning. And so um, if they write up that essay, then they get more points. And again, now they've had a quiz, a discussion, and an essay as a way to demonstrate that they understand one aspect of a learning outcome for the class. And so it's spread over time, but it gives them multiple opportunities. If you're a researcher, you're familiar with the concept of triangulation, where we are using multiple uh, checkpoints to make sure we're getting at the right data. And so we should be doing the same thing with our students to make sure we're helping them not have just one opportunity to show what they know, but multiple opportunities throughout the course. So here comes the challenge. And I'm going to just do a quick time check. Yeah. We have multiple roles in the room, right? So how many people said they were faculty developers? About a half a dozen to a dozen, right? So what would universal design for professional development look like? Are we applying these principles for things when we have faculty come to our workshops? If you're someone who's working in student services or in tech support, what can we do to make the process for students who are seeking help in some way? Uh, is it not just related to accessibility, but are we giving them multiple pathways to reach the same goal, whether it be I want to register for a course or I want to um, make sure that my computer's working or whatever. Even for performance reviews, we, as I left San Francisco State before I could uh, institute it, but I thought it would be a fantastic idea in addition to the text-based reviews that we all love in July, <laughs> and usually they get turned in around August, September, October, depends on when you can get them all written. But what about, um, I had a number of people in instructional designers and things like that working for me, and I thought, what if I could get them to create portfolios showcasing their achievements over the last year? So that in addition to all this text that says how great they are, they also have evidence that show, hey, this is what I did, and could be something that would help them for their career growth, something that would help them set goals for the, the next academic year, and so on. So, I'm going to challenge you all using a famous think, pair, share, and here's a famous pair that are thinking and sharing, um, President Obama and uh, the Dalai Lama. Uh, I want you to take one minute and brainstorm something outside the box, whether you're teaching and you want to give a, a new way to, for students to show achievement whether you're a faculty developer and you want to encourage faculty to showcase how they're applying what they've learned in those workshops, whether you're a staff member or uh, a campus leader, think about how you can have someone that you're going to ask them to show some sort of progress, achievement, what have you. Um, I'll give you a minute to think about uh, a way that you can do that with universal design principles in mind. And then you'll share with the neighbor, and then we'll shout out some answers, and then we'll move on. So I'll give you one minute starting now.
All right, we'll give you about another 25 seconds. All right, all right, we're gonna bring it back in five, four, three, two, and we're live here at Fresno State in the North Gymnasium, and we're about to hear the most amazing ideas about using universal design principles for all kinds of things. And because I am going to show you a technique that a, a little bit later, I'm just gonna call it tables and random rather than people uh, raising their hands. So I'm gonna go with that table in the very far back. You can't get away from me. What ideas did you come up with in your conversations? Yes. Yes. And so we've, we've talked about that we change that now and have other scaffolding assignments and different types of assignments, whether they're quizzes or crossword puzzles or discussion board assignments, so that we're scaffolding them toward the large exams at the end, but also giving them a basis for earning points before just having those exams. Fantastic, thank you. And Even if they've never heard of a crossword puzzle. <laughs> so I'll, just pick a table at random, Brian, and I'm gonna summarize that since uh, the beginning was cut off if you didn't hear, but starting with just a limited number of assessment formats and frequency, uh, expanding it to include things like crossword puzzles and other things, uh, fantastic. And there are free tools out there that allow you to create your own crosswords. Here we go, what did you guys come up with? Uh, I was just talking about this idea of like, okay, it's like, moving away from a more traditional idea of just having, let's say, like two exams, but then having a diversity of assignments. I'm questioning this idea of like distinguishing between universal design for learning and differentiation, where you just have different activities, but the same student will be doing all the different activities. But how do you actually focus down just on one assignment and get some variability within that one assignment? Fantastic. Okay, we'll do one more, and if somebody is uh, not a faculty member, some other role, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about universal design for professional development or for um, performance review, anything. And I know some of you, so I may just call people by name in a second. Brett Christie, where are you? Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, so, you bet. So here's an idea I was boring Leslie with. Um, no, what, what we did when we applied UDL at Sonoma State, we did faculty learning communities and the faculty who came out of that year-long process actually used the UDL framework to describe their teaching effectiveness for their RTP process. Mm -hmm. And the committees that received those documents were really blown away by that framework that they used. Yeah. Fantastic, thanks. So you can see, and uh, I'm, I'm here all day, I'm happy to chat about this, but there are lots of ways that we can apply universal design for learning just for assessment purposes. Almost any of the checkpoints work in that context. But for the sake of time, because the request was made, I wanna make sure we devote en enough time to also talk about equity. Oh, and I have a, a remote now and I'm still, <laughs> I'm getting in my steps. Um, so think to yourself, how would you define equity? One of the things that um, struck me most is when I looked in the dictionary, three words popped out, kind of like that teach every student for universal design for learning. Freedom from bias was the one, the three words that popped out 
at me around equity. And then uh, there's a longer definition of inclusion on the Fresno State Aspire website, but I like the, the fact that they talk about um, the active, intentional, and ongoing engagement with diversity. And then they talk about it in different contexts and with different goals in mind, but um, those are the way that we're gonna be looking at these terms for the next uh, dive into equity for assessment purposes. And so I'm gonna tell another story. This one's, I've been working with a community college district in Oakland, California. It's called the Peralta Community College District. And I first started working with them to help them with a distance education initiative. A, they were moving from Moodle to Canvas because all 114 community colleges have moved to Canvas. And so they had a challenge with how to make that work. And if any of you who have known me over the last 20 years, uh, I have half my learning objectives for any workshop I do are technology-based and half are pedagogy. For when I'm working with faculty, I wanna make sure there's an equal balance of teaching and technology. And so we started looking at things like um, quality, accessibility, all the things that you might find in online course design rubrics. How are we setting up enough interaction, things like that. What we didn't find in any rubric across the land, and trust me, I searched, was um, anything related to equity because we know that we're improving online courses with respect to quality and accessibility and other ways, but we're also still seeing achievement gaps for certain groups of students. And so we decided, well, let's just create one. So we did. And this team here um, is the group that put that together. Um, I kicked it off with um, research to make sure that the rubric itself was based on uh, evidence-based practices that show that it helps students uh, achieve. And then um, the group, uh, Inger Stark, Corey Hollis, who um, is a returning student uh, with military experience, African-American young man with, um, who is also the, the student trustee for the, for the district. So the students really knew him well and could give us a lot of feedback about whether or not we were on the right track. Uh, Chelsea Cohen teaches ESL courses at Laney College. And then we pulled in Alex Hernandez and Shrujana Tumu because they, again, in those other contexts, Alex is, uh, ran the help desk and Shrujana works on the uh, instructional design side and the technology support for the learning management system. So, um, we, we, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we expanded our thinking from, hey, we've developed this rubric that will support online instructors create more equitable courses to how do we use this rubric for face-to-face -face courses? How do we use this rubric for student services? How do we use this rubric for technology support desks? And so on. So the goals were um, we wanted to build online courses that serve all students. Again, very reflective of what we saw with the universal design for learning thinking. And we also wanted to institutionalize practices that promote equity because that's one of their district-wide goals, when we created a distance education plan, they had two values. One was equ equity and one was the learners themselves. And so we came up with a rubric that currently has eight criteria and we're gonna add a ninth related to social belonging in the next couple months. We have released it as a um, Creative Commons document, so anyone is welcome to go check it out right now. And there's the website. Um, as we know it's new, we've been doing presentations about it and people have been already saying they wanna adapt it to their own local needs and we just ask that you share it back out and tell us what you're doing so we can make improvements to this rubric. But you can see that the, the types of things, again, are, um, there's a strong overlap in the Venn diagram with universal design for learning. What access do we have to technology with respect to the learners? Um, right now, the California Community College System has a huge initiative to bring in uh, non-traditional learners in online courses. But we know from the Pew research that in some of those demographics like uh, Latinx students have less access to internet uh, at home. And so how do we bridge that gap with respect to just if you're gonna take an online course and you don't have access to the internet at home, does that make it harder for that person because they have to go somewhere? Can they use their phone and the cell towers near them? 
Um, different types of bias. Again, that freedom from bias is a key uh, concept that we want to uh, focus on. So diversity and inclusion uh, addresses things like cultural bias. There's what we know, uh, image and representation bias, which can um, be as um, common as uh, textbook images, um, publisher-created resources like PowerPoint presentations, things that we create ourselves and may not recognize that we're using stock photography that is limited to a certain pool of how people look and how they're represented in terms of are women being shown in leadership positions in these pictures versus men. Or um, again, when we look at the textbooks, there, uh, a group did a research about anatomy textbooks and found that most of the pictures are male unless it's the reproductive section of the anatomy book and most of the pictures are light skin tones. And so we're showing bias in just how we represent the body when people are learning how to meet the needs of every person who walks in that emergency room. Um, how do we make sure that we um, address interaction bias? And I'll talk about this in a second, but in online and face-to-face -face, uh, engagements, there are um, there is evidence that Instructors and students are, can show bias in the discussion process. How do we make sure that the content has meaning to our students? How do we make sure that we're creating personal connections with students and allowing them to create connections amongst each other? Uh, you'll see universal design for learning is on here because it is a way to increase equity. And then uh, again, we didn't want to forget the fact that students as learners touch more people than just other students and instructors. They work with librarians, they work with uh, tutors, they work with writing center staff, they work with um, registrar staff, uh, because that whole pipeline from enrollment in a class all the way through getting the transcript showing that you've completed it, there's a lot of people involved. And last but not least, again, we're gonna add a criterion related to social belonging because there's a lot of evidence that shows that students, and whether it be a STEM course or uh, an online course or whatever flavor you're talking about, um, students need to feel like they are welcome, that their contributions are valued, and that they uh, are able to do the work and that they know that they are being supported by the community of learners and instructors that, that are there. So again, uh, looking at some of the principles in more depth, um, when we look at diversity and inclusion and addressing cultural bias, how does that work in an assessment context? Well, um, let's look at test questions. If we're using test questions from a publisher again, a uh, pool of questions, and we just pick the ones that make the most sense, some of those may use um, culturally specific language. Uh, when I was working with Santa Monica College about assessment, an instructor had a light bulb go on when we were doing this workshop. She said, you know what? I talk about pressure in my physics course, and I talk about how I'm a scuba diver. But then it occurred to me after, because we had two days of workshop, she went to her students that same day. Nobody in her class had ever been scuba diving. So she was using a, a, a hobby that made the perfect analogy for pressure, but nobody knew what she was talking about. So she went out and found a different and she, was, she engaged the students in, okay, so what do you do where pressure might be, how many people go skiing, and you can do altitude changes, pressure, and all these things. So uh, being aware of the use of things that other people prepare for us and doing a quick check to make sure that there's no culturally specific language that might make it harder for some people to show what they know just because of the use of the words. Um, but the instructions for assignments, um, I'm a huge fan of Marianne Winkleness uh, transparent assignment template and I've had students who have failed my class who came back a second time after I revised all my instructions across the course and they said that was one of the key factors was having the purpose. It's again, it's just like UDL, what, why, and how. The purpose, why are we doing this in the first place? What are we going to do? These are the learning objectives we're going to reach, and then how. These are the steps you need to complete in order to successfully finish this activity. And so, um, there are other ways that we can address this cultural bias when we're looking at assessment. Um, and the 
it go, extends beyond test questions and instructions, but it, those are just some examples uh, for us to consider when we think about assessment. And again, the, the same thing that that instructor who uh, I used with the scuba analogy, um, she checked with her students. That's a fantastic way to maybe during test uh, exam review or test prep, um, getting them in the conversation so you understand what they're understanding and what they don't. When it comes to that interaction bias, I still have this in my hand and I still want it. Uh, I need that IV drip. Um, so the literature does show, there was a study out of Stanford that um, online instructors are most likely to respond to white male student names. Not being able to see any pictures of the students or anything else, they'll respond most frequently first and sometimes only to white male names. And so I saw this literature and I said, am I doing that? I have an online class with 100 students every semester. So what I started doing is I created a Google spreadsheet with my roster and I have every discussion forum and then I have a column that counts how many times I have an X next to each student's name and it's, I've got that, if you've ever done conditional formatting, if it says zero or one, it's just bright red uh, and bold because I want to be accessible. You can't just use color to denote difference. <laughs> But uh, that way I can see, oh, that, that's the student I need to answer first this week. Uh, and sometimes it's because they haven't posted anything because you have some students who just don't engage in these online. So that gives me an opportunity to go write an email to that person and say, hey, I haven't seen your voice in these discussions. We want you to be involved. And so that's a way to make sure I can start making the online discussion aspect of assessment more equitable, to make sure that everybody's getting the same amount of feedback from the instructor. And then if you're in a classroom situation, uh, Linda Nelson from Clemson talks about creating a stack of index cards or having students fill them out with little facts about themselves and then put, put them on uh, the desk in front of the room or in your pocket. But again, to have a positive sense of stress, students know that whatever the top card is, is the name that's going to answer the question, like I did with Brett earlier. Thanks for playing along, Brett. So the concept being that every student knows they may be required to answer questions. They come to class more prepared, but it's more equitable because you don't get the dominant talkers answering every question. You get the, um, every student contributing to the conversation, and it doesn't mean that they have to have the answer all the time. It just means that they're ready to contribute to the conversation, and you might call on the next card to fill in gaps if a student ha doesn't have the complete answer, but it's a way to um, make it a more equitable process. And again, the literature shows that classroom situations aren't much different than the online situations. There are biases that instructors and fellow students exhibit in classroom di uh, this discussion dynamic. This example I love from Laney College the instructor's name is Alicia Caballero Christensen. She teaches ethnic studies. When we, dis when we talked to instructors to see who was already using equity-based principles in their teaching, this instructor had shifted from showing a video in class and having the students talk about it to having the students all show the video in their family, in their community, with their set of friends that weren't in the class and have a discussion or a debate about the topics that were presented in that film. And they had to document it with a video, with a picture, with some uh, evidence that they had led this discussion. And so they were able to increase the meaning of that topic because it was embedded in a local conversation with people those students knew well. And so um, to me, this is an exciting take on an assessment practice of having students show that they understand the content of media by having them infuse it with local meaning. Getting close. And then last but not least, um, showing connections among students uh, and, and facilitating those connections. Uh, Zaretta Hammond has a fantastic book called um, Culturally Responsive Teaching. And I would encourage you to check it out. But she has uh, some suggestions that help us 
create connections for students in an assessment context, whether it be peer review, which is something that many of us do already, but thinking about how we can uh, emphasize that and let students know what's going on, why, one of the reasons why we're creating these connections, but also um, group projects or even um, small group and whole class discussions, letting them know that one purpose of it is to um, create a more equitable process. So I'm going to move to this just for the sake of time because I want to do another activity with you all. Like we did with Universal Design for Learning, we started thinking of it in different contexts. I gave examples of using equity principles from this rubric we created for learning situations. But I mentioned that the people who helped us create it came from different aspects of the campus support network. And so technology help desk staff student services staff, et cetera. So your think pair share is to have that same exercise but thinking about the equity principles that I just outlined. How can you apply those principles to something either in your course, something that you haven't done before, if you're a faculty developer, in the professional development activities you construct and facilitate, and if you're a, a staff member or a campus leader, how can you apply equity principles to uh, your daily life and the, and the work you do with the campus community. So we'll keep this short because I know we're under the five minute, so I'll give you a couple seconds to brainstorm and then chat with neighbors and we'll just shout out one or two ideas and we'll let you all get on to the day. All right, let's get started. All right, I'll give you another 30 seconds or so. I'll ask Brian to head to a table he hasn't touched before. All right, all right, we're going to bring it back in five, four, three, two, and we're live at Fresno State. Brian? So one of the things we noticed is that even though we think we're being um, inclusive of all dimensions, there are blind spots where we forget to be inclusive. That's, that's true, yes, thank you. Anybody else? Brian, the table you haven't touched, maybe the one just right behind you, just to save you from running. What we are, the concern that we had is that the accessibility for students to have a reliable internet or Wi-Fi connection for content, especially for online courses. 
that is that bridge, and depending on that location you are in, you may not have any accessibility to that. Absolutely, especially with um, demanding video segments, or so breaking them into smaller chunks, not requiring students to download them because a four gigabyte video could take probably six days. <laughs> so, uh, one more. Oh, great, right up here. I want to comment in regards to videos, videos that are accessible to diversity of individuals. If a hearing individual, one who can hear, is speaking, make sure that captions are provided as well as a transcript for those who are low vision and deaf. In other videos that might include a deaf person signing, we make sure to provide captions as well as a vocal background and a transcription because we want to be sensitive to the diversity of needs amongst the people. Absolutely, that's a good point. And what I have uh, made a practice if I haven't been able to connect with the campus resources for captioning is I make it an extra credit assignment for students, bonus points. Because by having them listen to a mini lecture, it's them studying further, most of my mini lectures are only five minutes long. My transcription uh, is eight to one ratio when I did my dissertation. I, every hour was eight hours of typing it up. So, um, but if you say, hey, I have these five minute videos that I've created related to the topics, who wants to volunteer to transcribe one? And then I have, you know, it's 80 to 90% of the way there and I can fix it up, but um, that's an alternative if your campus doesn't have. Um, the capacity or the budget to caption every film that you make. And, and it's something to consider because students start generating their own videos, Flipgrid videos and things like that that are becoming ways to create interactions amongst students. Um, so we wanna make it uh, an equi equitable process. Thank you for sharing that. So I've got one minute, so the summary is on the screen and the slides will be available to download for the low, low price of, I'm just kidding. People are paying attention still, that's good. Um, but what we covered were, again, assessment concepts with two different lenses, universal design for learning and equity. There are some tools out there that can help the process of making it more part of your life and your uh, teaching and learning process. The UDL guidelines on one side and that equity rubric on the other. And then if you're not in a teaching and learning situation on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, then I encourage you to start thinking about how you make it part of the larger campus culture and all the things that you do so that it's not just something we do for and with students, but it's something we do, period. And then if you download these slides, I've got some good books related to the topics that we covered. Assessment, uh, again, the Barclay book and uh, with Major and Angelo and Cross did the, the original one. Um, some books about universal design for learning some resources related to equity. And since we're out of time, I'll, uh, st I'll stick around for questions while people are migrating to the next sessions. But I uh, really appreciate your energy and your attention, and I'm excited to learn with all of you throughout the rest of the day. And so um, let's go do some great stuff.